Hello, I'm Bob Trebshaw. I'd like to talk to you today about something I flippantly call the G.K. Chesterton approach to historical research. He's the chap who back in 1927 wrote, I suppose they set a lunatic to catch a lunatic on the principle of setting a thief to catch a thief. Uh, This has been typically misquoted as, to catch a thief you need to think like a thief. At least ten years ago, and most probably about twenty years ago, I came to the conclusion that to understand Anglo-Saxon culture, you need to think like an Anglo-Saxon. I hope you agree there's nothing lunatic or criminal about that. The question then is, how did Anglo-Saxons think? Clearly not like modern secular post-Reformation folks. And the earlier Anglo-Saxons didn't even think like the pre-Reformation Christians of, say, the 12th century onwards, because the Benedictine reforms around the 12th century were fairly radical at that time, although it's a rather overlooked phase in Christian history. While back then I thought the question, how did Anglo-Saxons think, was quite important, frankly, I couldn't figure out any way to answer it. I just carried on reading about Anglo-Saxon England and a whole load of other stuff too. For example, in the late 1990s I got deeply interested in the ideas which had originated in the 1980s about the construction of social reality. I took this a step or two further and became particularly interested in how the ideas which construct and reconstruct our social worlds are actually transmitted Um, I went so far as to write a book about all this, although it was published under a pseudonym. It's available online as a free PDF. Link in the description below. Now let's stop for a moment. Why on earth should you be interested in all the construction of social reality? Isn't this just something I did in the background, as it were? Well, yes, to a large extent. But if I'd never done all this around 20 or so years ago, there's a heck of a lot of other stuff, not least much of my historical research that simply would not have come about. Quite specifically, I would not have picked up on those few clues as to how the Anglo-Saxons constructed their society or social reality, and how the Anglo-Saxon social reality evolved around the conversion era. And, much more importantly, how that social reality didn't change very much at all during the conversion era. I was beginning to realise that it really does help to be able to think, at least to some extent, like an Anglo-Saxon. I'm only aware of a handful of other folks interested in the Anglo-Saxon era who have something of the same awareness, and there may be more, simply not come to my attention. But, by and large, historians and archaeologists are not trained in comparative ontology. Comparative what? Ontology. It's the branch of metaphysics concerned with the nature and relations of being. Right at the roots, it defines what we think is reality, and what we think is supernatural, and what we think doesn't exist at all. But speaking metaphorically, there are lots of fascinating ontological branches, twigs, leaves and flowers, growing from these uh, roots. There's a couple of more friendly words, which mean almost the same thing as ontology. One is cosmology except when the term cosmology is used by astrophysicists who use it to mean something else. And the other is worldviews, which is almost self-explanatory. Worldviews are about how we view the world. So in this video I'll mostly use worldviews, except when I need the adjective, because ontological is a word, and worldviewical isn't a word, and it's a word that most certainly doesn't need to exist. Let's give some examples of worldviews. If you're an ancient Greek or Roman... You think the deities are imminent. They live in a penthouse suite at the top of Mount Olympus, and if they fancy meeting up with a mortal woman, they just wander down to the river and do so. As you said, a bit of reputation for doing just that rather often. If you're an ancient Hebrew, you think Yahweh is transcendent. Even if you trudge to the top of Mount Sinai to take down a spot of dictation, you won't get to see him. If Yahweh feels a need to get a mortal woman pregnant, he has to send Archangel Gabriel down to have a word in the girl's ear on his behalf. Interestingly, Gabriel has to put in another appearance to say that the baby's name needs to be Emmanuel. In other words, the imminent one. But the baby's parents don't want the child to be bullied for having such a weird name, so they're calling Yeshua just like many of the other boys of his age. In other words, Joshua. 
but Jesus, according to translations of the Bible into Latin and then vernacular languages. If you're Chinese, ancient or modern, you don't think there are any gods at all, imminent or transcendent. You are aware of important people who allegedly became immortals, but they don't go off to heaven, still less to hell. The best we can say about them is that they're somewhere in the forest towards the top of the highest mountains, cloud-hidden and whereabouts unknown. One thing about worldviews is that they only change very slowly. And there is a very good reason why worldviews change slowly. We are almost not aware of them. They are, so to speak, the water in which we swim. Actually, the best analogy I've come across is that worldviews are like the lenses in spectacles. We look through them, but rarely stop to look at them. We only notice worldviews which are different to ours, typically those of foreign cultures. Indeed, it is because of this implicit difference that they are deemed foreign cultures. If there was no sense of difference, then they would be unlikely to be deemed foreign. Yeah, it's circular. We rarely, if ever, define what is normal. We just mentally patrol the boundary of what is deemed to be non-normal or abnormal. So the notion of normality is defined by what is excluded, rarely by what is explicitly included. Um, Such included groups can be as small as a family, or a social group within a large workplace, or be as big as a nation. We simultaneously and successively swim in an assortment of more or less overlapping worldviews. And other than odd folk like me, we probably never give it a moment's thought. Indeed, apart from ethnographers, few people consciously look at worldviews. They exist at a, shall we say, taken-for-granted level of culture. Ethnographers predictably have a phrase to describe looking at worldviews from outside perspectives, or not. The two words are etic and emic. Etic refers to studies of cultures from the outside, so you're looking at cross-cultural differences. Emic refers to research that studies culture, as it were, from the inside, with little or sometimes no cross-cultural awareness. When we deem a culture to be foreign, we are acknowledging that we cannot approach it in an entirely emic matter. The most superficial etic approach is simply to recognise that another culture is other to our own. Worldviews which are significantly different come into contact usually as a result of long-distance trade or perhaps military campaigns. Sometimes two worldviews come together as a smooth synthesis. More often, they just crash into each other. Academics call this misfitting mashup syncretism. Um, Christianity is regarded as a good example of syncretism. The New Testament of the Bible attempts to combine the transcendent Hebrew worldview with the imminent Greco-Roman worldview. And it's this syncretism which is key to, well, the fourth gospel written by St. John and the extensive letters and acts of St. Paul. Furthermore, the Essen and Nazarene sects within which Jesus was raised had practices such as living in monastic communities and ideas which, at the time, were only known in Indian Buddhism, suggesting yet another entirely plausible strand of syncretism. Right, enough of such Mediterranean digressions. Let's get back to Anglo-Saxon in England. At the time of the Gregorian mission, or the Augustinian mission, at the end of the 6th century. Yeah, two names, same event, two different folk get credited. Gregory was the Pope with the bright idea, and Augustine was the sidekick who got told to trek to Kent to get the job done. Uh, Historical records suggest Augustine didn't exactly volunteer, and indeed at one point he returned to Rome to seek permission to cancel the mission. I digress again. Anyways, in the first half of the 7th century, the Roman Church extended its influence in south-east England, and then steadily among the more western and northern parts of the British Isles, where Christianity had already been introduced from Ireland. We know a bit about this period because the Venerable Bede wrote a book called The Ecclesiastical History of the English People. Bede was a monk who lived from the 670s until 735, so about a hundred years after the events he records. Recent scholarship has delved in detail as to how reliable Bede might have been. The research of David Petz, based at Durham University, is especially important in this regard, but that's not what this video is about. There's just one thing about Bede's account I want to focus on. It's what he doesn't tell us. He never says anything 
about the beliefs of the British people before the conversion. And you're going, well, of course he wouldn't. He just wanted to write about how things were so much better after everybody became Christian. Well, maybe that too. But the absence of information can be read another way. Why do I think that? Because of some detailed analysis written by Ronald Hutton in his 2007 book called The Druids. He's writing about the pagans in northern France and northern Germany during the Roman era, specifically the visits by, successively, Julius Caesar, Diodorus Siculus, Strabo and Tacitus. And there's also assessments written at her distance by Pliny and Suetonius. I promise you this is relevant to Anglo-Saxon England around 500 years later. But these Roman authors consistently describe the ritual sacrifices made by Druids in northern France, northern Germany, as being more barbaric than corresponding Roman rites. And that's about all they tell us. Which, as Ronald Hutton astutely recognised, means that what these people in Gaul are doing was, in all significant respects, the same as what the Romans were doing at that time. Most importantly, the reason why the Gauls were sacrificing to get a better harvest was of no surprise, else otherwise everyone would have mentioned the difference. So, the inference has to be that there was a shared religious worldview from the Mediterranean to the North Sea. The, uh, shall I say, measured responses of Caesar, Siculus and Strabo are in total contrast to, say, 19th century missionaries venturing into Africa who were appalled by nearly every aspect of indigenous religion. Even the more objective accounts of 20th century ethnographers reveal a distinct sense of otherness to the worldviews they encountered. As a result of reading Ronald Hutton's analysis, I had one of those light bulb moments. Just as Caesar and his near contemporaries spotted nothing odd, just more barbaric, about Gaulish druids, then perhaps Bede's comparable of silence about pre-conversion worldviews was for the same reason. In other words, presumably there was no big difference in worldview between the unconverted and the converted English, which is what would be entirely reasonable to expect, and indeed fits well with at least one aspect of the evidence. I'll, I'll come back to that. The reason we perhaps don't think that this smooth transition is reasonable is simply because centuries of later historians, especially ones of recent centuries, have imposed the notion that before conversion to Christianity, the English were terrible heathens and pagans. The conversion and baptism of such dreadful demon-infested people was a dramatic act of piety for all involved. It wasn't. Get real. 7th century conversion was top-down. The king was approached, accepted the offer of conversion, it had plenty of political advantages as well as arguable spiritual ones, and was baptised by a senior cleric. That senior cleric was then appointed bishop of the king's lands. And to this day the Bishop of Worcester has a see or bishopric which corresponds in all but a few details with the extent of the lands of the Hwicca in the year 680 the time of the Wiccan king's conversion. For everybody below the king, it was the same as usual. The kings had always decided which day it is to propitiate, with each king having his own preferences. To be flippant, it's a bit like owners of large manufacturing businesses in Lancashire being football supporters. All of them will go to the match on Saturday. Some will prefer Man United, some Man City, some Everton, or whatever. One or two might even have a soft spot for Accrington Stanley. The key thing is that whenever possible, these owners go to a footy match on a Saturday afternoon. Which team they support is a matter of personal preference. Now, I'm sorry if that seems a flippant analogy in a discussion of religion, but actually football is more like a religion for most supporters and way more ritualistic than most modern-day Christian denominations. Back to the Anglo-Saxons. And back to that one thing we know about post-conversion worldviews, which fits in well with the suggestion of continuity. We know that around the time of the conversion, the Gospels were not regarded by either clerics or laity as something in opposition to previous beliefs and practices. Instead, the Gospels were seen as the culmination of what had gone before. A benevolent, bread-bestowing Lord who, at least for a time, walked this earth, fitted in very well with existing Anglo-Saxon and Germanic worldviews. At least one author, James Russell, 
has argued that this is not just coincidence, but her deliberate strategy by the missionaries to adapt Mediterranean Christianity to North European outlooks. Russell's book is called The Germanization of Christianity. It came out in 1990, and I'm not aware of any academic since attempting to undermine his main approach. I sometimes and a little flippantly suggest that if he wanted to sell lots more copies, he should have called it the paganisation of Christianity, as it's nigh on the same difference. I'll attempt to provide an example. If you've had any involvement in Eastern meditation and mysticism, then you'll have come across words like Shakti, Prana, Purusha, Kami, Ki, or even the Mana of Polynesian cultures. If you have an African heritage, you may be aware of Ash, or something like. These words all refer to something like a creative energy flowing through the whole of creation, manifesting through ancient trees, traumatic rocks, respected humans, and so forth and so forth. It is the key that is in the Chinese De Ki Kuang and Ki Gong. It is also the key that is in the Japanese word Reiki. Graham Harvey has described the mana of Polynesia as more like charisma or a gift, as in the expression, a gifted child. Whatever, it flows through everything in the same way that gravity influences everything on Earth without ever being seen. Seemingly, North European and Scandinavian cultures once had something similar. The old English word leek, which has the primary sense of potency, was one name. Arguably, it was also called wad in England and Uther in Scandinavia. And this may well be why there are gods called Woden and Uthin, and commonly mispronounced as Odin, who have what in them or Uther in them. Wadin? Utherin. Yeah, Woden, Uthin. Some scholars dispute these etymologies, but I'm not aware that they've offered anything that makes better sense. Arguably, before dragons breathed fire, they were Wormers, breathing leek, or what? or Utha, something more like the breath of life, or the Pentecostal tongues of fire. Come the conversion, and this potency, this leak, becomes the potentia of Christ, channeled through an ordained priest. Potentia is Latin and means potency, so on to one match for old English leak. Interestingly, when an early priest died, his remains still channeled this potentia, so his bones and so forth became holy relics, an idea which continued until the uh, 16th century Reformation. Uh, well, it's still current in the Roman Catholic Church. As the notion of Christianity as a Trinitarian faith took hold, this potentia became the Sanctus Spiritus, sadly now known in English as the Holy Ghost because of a dire 16th century translation from German. Yes, Geist in German is cognate with English ghost, but to a German speaker, Geist means spirit, not what English people think of when you say ghost. And there's another continuity. The old English poem Beowulf sheds considerable light on the burial of treasure and how such buried treasure was dedicated to the deities. However, as Wade Tartseer recognised a number of years ago, treasure continued to be hoarded long after the conversion. It was simply made into reliquaries, croziers, liturgical chalices and patterns and so forth and so forth. The rhetoric changes, so such wealth was for the glory of God rather than being a votive offerings, but that's an essentially a difference between emicinetic perspectives and not because of a fundamental difference in worldview. And the Staffordshire hoard includes Christian crosses, but the hoard could well have been buried as part of a ritual honouring a pagan deity. So I think we can begin to think like Anglo-Saxons, but understanding Christianity before around the 10th century we are seeing a synthesis of the pre-conversion worldview with an added layer based mostly on the Gospels. There are some scholars in academe who also picked up evidence for continuity of worldviews around the 7th and 8th century. Audrey Meany was the first in her pioneering study of Anglo-Saxon amulets and curing stones. She concluded that to understand Anglo-Saxon amulets you needed to understand Anglo-Saxon culture, but... To understand Anglo-Saxon culture, you needed to understand what Anglo-Saxons thought about amulets. A similar sort of back-to-back mirroring ethos was adopted by Karen Jolly in her study of popular religion in Anglo-Saxon England. Both Jeremy Hart and Susan Kilby have delved into place names which contain Old English words relating to supernatural beings such as giants and elves and dragons and much more. 
uh, actually pedantically these other than normal beings are not so much supernatural as preternatural but I'll save all that for a future video ok so let's wrap this long video up attempting to think like an Anglo-Saxon to establish a plausible Anglo-Saxon worldview led me to make a significant number of insights into Anglo-Saxon beliefs and customs. For example, the video on rethinking Anglo-Saxon boundary shrines simply would not have come about without such insights. I plan to make a video specifically about pre-conversion worldviews being imminent, um, although I'm not quite sure when it will be put together, it's not at the top of my job list. In the meantime, in the description below I'll include a link to a PDF about this and another PDF with a longer version of this video.